cloud. Beep, boop, boop, boop. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, Culture First Global Chapter event, the Podcast Listeners Club for Rethinking Trust at Work with Rachel Botsman. Um, we're really excited to dig into this episode with you all. Um, I'm Jesse Jacob. I am our Senior Community Engagement Manager running our 93 global chapters now with almost 10,000 community members at this point. Uh, and so it's an honor to be here today with you all and have the host of the Culture First podcast with us, Damon Klotz, today. So, um, this has become a fun ongoing series. It started with just like let's try this. Uh, and now we're like, oh, this is a recurring thing. And we've had such meaningful conversations with you all. So looking forward to digging into this episode. Um, okay. But it wouldn't be a culture first gathering uh, unless we, where did you all go? Doop -doop -doop. Can you all see my, my slides? Yes. Okay. Yeah, great. I don't know why. You haven't said anything. Everyone's still here. Like there wasn't a mass walkout. Yeah. <laughs> you all disappeared. I don't know. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, it wouldn't be a culture first gathering if we didn't talk about who we are as a community uh, and our principles and how we do things around here. So what is the culture first community? We are a group of people around the world united in the shared belief that a better world of work is possible. Uh, around here, we create inspiring experiences that ultimately amplify, educate, and connect other culture-first activists. Um, we have some five core principles that hold us all together. You can think about this as like the, the community's culture. These are, this is the glue that holds all of us together and also how we um, aspire to show up in even a culture-first gathering. So the first one being fostering belonging and acceptance, so being able to create an environment where individuals are um, accepted, seen, and valued for bringing their diverse perspectives, background stories, uh, and things like that. Our second principle is being willing to reflect and grow. So this idea of growth mindset for we're on a mission to transform the way that we work, that goes to transforming our organizations. And ultimately that starts with us doing the work as individuals. So being able to turn the mirror around and uh, understand how we want to show up and be the change we wanna see in the world. Our third core principle is have the courage to be vulnerable. So this idea of, uh, I'm so excited, we're going to talk about vulnerability loops for some of you that got into the episode, but uh, we're going to go into a vulnerability loop dance with each other. And that's what like we aspire to do in the Culture First community as well, which is, um, you know, we wearing all these masks and uh, layers all the time with I'm this role or and I work at this organization, but underneath all of that, we're human beings. And so how do we um, take off those masks, connect at, connect at a deeper level and create more trust and psychological safety with one another. The fourth core principle is putting learning into action. We didn't want our culture first gatherings to just be another place where you consume information and it's in one ear and out the other. We wanted this to be a place where you could come and digest the information, feel inspired to take action afterwards and do something about ultimately creating a better world of work. And the fifth core principle is connection inside, business outside. So that's just a fancy schmancy way of saying that ultimately we're here to connect as human beings first on the inside. And if that leads to us doing business on the outside of the context of the gathering, that's awesome. Uh, but that's not the primary purpose. So it's not just another networking group uh, and not just another place for people to push business cards. And at no point is anyone going to get pitch culture amp during this. So <laughs> there we are. Um, and I've seen so many of you, so uh, it's great to see familiar faces back here. You know how we do things around here. Okay, uh, our agenda for the day, we are going to talk about the purpose of our gathering. We're going to have a little time to intentionally connect with each other. We'll do some initial reflections of the episode, and then we'll pick some, we've picked some fun little snippets to really dive into as well. And then again, there's that action piece. What, what are we putting into action? And then we'll close up and get out of here in like an hour and a half. Our purpose today is to bring together fellow Culture First community members with the intention to connect and learn as a group about how to increase our trust with the unknown and rethinking assumptions we have about the workplace. Okay, so moving us into our connection time. Uh, some of you have seen this before. This is very culture first. <laughs> so we're going to do an exercise called, if you really knew me, 
you would know that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, I'll put this in the chat as well so you can see this. But essentially, you're going to go into a breakout room. And if you really knew me, you would know that. Uh, you're going to go into a breakout room for roughly like three minutes. There will be like a little buffer time to come back. And what I'd like for you all to do is with your partner, each of you take a minute and a half. So someone please set a timer uh, and, and, and fill in the gaps with this. If you really knew me, you would know that. So I'll, I'll like model this for just a few moments here. I'll set a timer for 20 seconds just so you all can see this, but here we go. So if you really knew me, you would know that uh, I am born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, if you really knew me, you would know that I have an older brother who's like a, one of my best friends and he lives in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. If you really knew me, you would know that I have a two-year-old dog. I fell prey to getting a COVID puppy and I've named her Ray after the female Jedi from Star Wars. <laughs> Um, and if you really knew me, you would know that I just moved into my new house today. Um, so I'm feeling really excited about that. All right. There was, that's an example of like a 20 second. If you really knew me, you would know that. But the idea is you'll go into a breakout room for three minutes total. And uh, you'll, each person will get a minute and 30 to fill in the blank of, if you really knew me, you would know that. So um any questions about this exercise or what we're doing? Yeah, if you're if you're not able to turn on video and you want to just listen, that's okay. Um, just let me know. Um, okay. Show thumbs up, like yes, this exercise makes sense. We know what we're doing. Okay, great. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so I'm gonna uh, create these breakout rooms and. There we go. We're going to go in for, okay, you'll have three minutes with like a 60 second countdown to help kind of like close thoughts and everything. So here we go. Teresa, are you still there? Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> uh, how was that experience? Love to hear just some like reflections of what was that like for you? Have you done this before? <laughs> what was it like emotionally? Your example didn't didn't exactly prompt us to be super vulnerable, so I went there anyway, <laughs> knowing that it's you know personally that's my path to growth. But um, it's nice hearing about other people's wins. Mm. And um, and Lani, is that how you say your name, Lani? Um, uh, and her her ideas and what she's curious about and um, what she's passionate about. Oh, I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Kami. Yeah, that's so good. Anyone else want to share their reflection of that episode or of, of the episode of that experience? <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> I liked the prompt because it really didn't direct you to be vulnerable. So you really could draw your own line if you wanted to dive in that, in that area or you didn't. So I really liked the, it, it, I thought the way it is phrased and also the repeating of it helped me really kind of dig in and think about what I want to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, um, it's like you get to play with that edge of vulnerability, you know? very much an onion layered question is kind of like uh -huh. when you ask someone like how are you and they go yeah good and you go how are you and they go yeah I'm okay then you go how are you and you're like oh like you actually want me to like really dig into this a little bit more and have this conversation and I think if you really knew me it's pretty similar it's like oh if you really knew me I'm like 
straight white male you're like yeah i can probably pick up some of those vibes already then you're like if you really knew me like i've been going through this this week or like something's happening in my family or something else it allows you to keep going with it but i think one thing that we'll discuss is that vulnerability loops need to be caught if you hit a wall with your vulnerability then it, you close down so i think one of the ways that this exercise demonstrates that is it really showcases the power of two people being in conversation with each other and it's not necessarily a vulnerability battle where you're like oh you shared that watch me i can go <laughs> further it's like it's not a vulnerability competition it's more so just like saying that you've heard that and that you've acknowledged that and that um you know like when you share something you don't want someone to go back and go oh really that's really sad yeah my sadder moment was this it's like no 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 like we're not trying to have a competition of who's had the hardest week here <laughs> it's a dance you know that's yeah. kind of the visual that comes to mind for me yeah all right i love it okay so uh, we're going to do this one more time, same partner this time, uh, go again for a minute and a half each, uh, I'll, I'm going to extend the room to just be open for five minutes. So that way you have just like a, a few minutes to just kind of like after each partner goes reflect and digest and all that good stuff. Um, so again, like kind of what um, Kimmy was talking about, like, you know, that uh, playing with that edge of like vulnerability and like thinking about embodying our principle of having the courage to be vulnerable. Um, so obviously share whatever you're most, you're comfortable sharing, um, but like think about where that edge is um, and how that can help you kind of grow as a human being. So uh, I'm gonna, everyone understand what we're doing again, same round same, same person, just a little bit longer time in the room, but still a minute and a half this time. Okay. Here we go. Seconds here. Everyone's rolling back in. All right. All right. How was round two? I would love to hear how that experience was different from round one and um, how did it go? Even deeper. Mm, so good. Tell me more. <laughs> Lonnie, you want to you want to tell your side of it? I think I think um, the second prompt really helps you to sort of, you know, tap into that. What are you most concerned about? What are you being vulner vulnerable about? Um, and just being able to share that with someone that you know you maybe have met briefly before, but they don't really know that much about you, so they can give you real honest. Um, perspective and um, share some, you know, thinking that's really useful and valuable. Um, and, and it's a great way to truly connect with someone. Yeah. So yeah. awesome. Thank you, Lonnie. Yeah, Borja, please go. No, for me, so I didn't join the first one, but I joined the second one. And immediately uh, for me, it was learning uh, a lot about someone uh, that better helps me understand what they might be going through that you would never imagine unless you heard directly from their mouth. And it's just something that I say often, which is you just don't know what people are going through. It doesn't show when you look at them. There's a lot of uh, suffering and pain and other things going on in people's lives that we should always be sort of empathetic towards. And and then by understanding that, it just, just you know, it, it just, it helps a lot in getting to know someone because then you can sort of better feel get a better feel for what they're they're going through so true thanks for sharing that so good I know my mom used to as a child you know she'd have me talk to like she's that mom that would be in line at the grocery store and like is talking to everyone and I was just like ah stop you know <laughs> like but like now as an adult I'm so grateful that she was like that because she would always tell me well everyone has a story Jesse everyone has a story and there's that's like such a like this is exactly that it's just like everyone has a story everyone has these things that are like have happened in their life that you would never be able to know under all the masks that we're wearing all the time, you know? But. 
I think our brains are wired to use assumptions and things that we can see to help us tell a story about the world around us really quickly. And I think that's one of the potential risks in the workplace is we use whatever we can see, whether it's job titles, whether it's someone's appearance, whether it's the way that they're presenting themselves as a quick way to make connections in our brain to help us understand people, but doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right way or the best way to get to know someone. And I think by doing this twice, we quickly showed the power of like the first level was context. And then the second level was understanding mm. and like better understanding someone. Like the only difference between a stranger and a friend is like you lack context on that person. You don't have anything to prompt a conversation with them about. And we showed really quickly how to get there. And um, I was lis listening to an interview with Austin Butler, the actor who played uh, Elvis. Um, and, you know, he shared that he was so shy as a kid that he couldn't order a, a um, like food at a restaurant like up until like a certain age, like his parents had to like order for him. He couldn't talk to a stranger. And then like that's someone who's gone on and you think, wow, you love literally play other people now on <laughs> film and you're so confident in someone else's skin. But like he struggled so much with communication from his own self. So I think just having a chance to have these conversations with each other, one breaks down those assumptions and two allows us to just build up some of that trust with each other so that we can catch those vulnerability loops. Uh, same on like, yes, and something that jogged for me when you were speaking was like how our brain wants to like jump to the bias we have about someone. And then like, it totally relates back to just like that creates a level of certainty for our brains to be able to like <laughs> conceptualize the things around us quickly and be able to take action. Um, but it, it goes back to this, like the, the unknown being able to have a level of comfort with the unknown, you know? Anyone else want to share their reflections uh, or any other, any aha moments you had or anything before we move on? Yeah. Practicing sharing also builds trust in ourselves. Yes. Heavy plus one to that. Um, well, thank you all for participating in that, embodying our principle of having the courage to be vulnerable. Um, I mean, this exercise is so powerful and please, you know, continue to use this in other contexts, uh, steal away. This has been, it's a culture first staple around here. Uh, and even Damon asks uh, this question to open interviews, which is, I think is really cool too. So um, please use this. I think I've done this probably like hundreds of times and my answers are never the same. I mean, of course there's parts of my story that I share, but it's not like I have a talk track for this every time, which I also find really interesting about this exercise and like how even the way that Damon uses it on the podcast is like, what do we need to know about you today? You know, where are you in this location? How are you doing like um, emotionally today? Um, rather than just like, if you really knew me in general, like kind of how we took it today. So another, a great way to use this as well. All right. With that, I'm just, I'm going to hand it over to Damon. Let's get into the podcast episode. We've started to talk about trust and the unknown, but let's dig in. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to use the rest of the time to be in conversation with each other. I've got a couple of prompts. We're actually going to play a couple of live clips from the episode. Um, just as a show of hands, did anyone come to this event? Absolutely blind and not listening to this event. Sorry, not listening to the podcast at all. Um, that is amazing. All right. Well, you're going to get a, a fast track on some of the things that were there. It is an hour long plus episode. Um, definitely one of my longer ones. And, and that is after an edit. So you can only imagine how long the actual conversation was. Rachel was, uh, Rachel was very um, giving with her time. Um, in terms of just, I guess, uh, sharing how the episode is made, one of the... Um, one of the things that, and we'll play a clip about this with the vulnerability loops is a lot of what happens before an episode goes live is basically an exercise on what we just did. So there's a lot of things that happened before I hit record in order for me to feel like I'm not speaking to a stranger. And it can be really hard with some of these guests who are really well-known and have, who do this all the time. And they're just like, they have their answers ready. Um, but like, I will say Rachel was incredibly warm and accommodating with her time. Um, you know, I, I had the pleasure of picking and working with all of our keynote speakers for our Culture First events globally. And um, I won't name names. I'm not here to shame people, but certain speakers are literally like, I just want to come in and do the talk and that's what you pay me for. And like, 
you get what you get because I'm really good. I'm like, that's amazing. And then other people like want to work with us and they want to sit down and they want to have a briefing session and they want to discuss what's the best way to bring this content to life. Um, you know, Rachel did that. Her team sat down with us. We looked at our data, her data. We looked at the research, we looked at trends that we were seeing about trust and relationships. And she created something net new for us when she spoke at our Culture First event and then agreed to do the podcast. And for me, one of the ways that I like to show up for people, and I think um, hopefully it was reflected in the quality of the conversation, is what I say to myself is like, what would it take for me today to be this person's biggest fan in the world? Like, what would it take for me to like love them more than they love themselves today? You know, what would it take for me to like do everything possible to give this person every chance to make this a platform for them to shine brighter than they've ever shined before? And I know that's like incredibly aspirational, like I'm no Oprah here, um, but like, I think even just giving yourself those intentions of like, what would it take for this person to just have everything, you know, um, to feel comfortable enough to share some of those things. And one of the ways, and I share some of these things because it's, I think it's also things that we can um, emulate in the workplace about getting to know each other. So I do 10 plus hours of research per guest. I try to find really like deep snippets and clips of things that they've shared in the past in order for me to have a conversation that's not going to sound like every other time this person has been on a podcast. And, you know, one of the things that I saw from, um, and I actually, I completely creatively steal this from a, another podcast called, um, or another YouTube show called Hot Ones, which is a show where celebrities eat wings and they get progressively spicer, uh, spicier. And by the end, they're basically sharing all the stuff they've never shared before because they're hallucinating. Now I can't get these people to hallucinate virtually on my show. Um, but what I can do is do the same amount of research that allows those moments to happen. And um, Sean Evans, who hosts that, says that he's a team of four or five researchers who one of their most powerful ways to get really interesting snippets about people is to go back to their local newspapers from when they were first breaking out. Because like local journalists usually have access to family and friends to learn about some of these celebrities. And they're like, you know, if you find their first newspaper clipping, there's a really great story in there that they might not get asked about all the time. And again, I'm not interviewing, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson or Beyonce, so I don't get access to that amount of media, but I do get access to articles that they've been part of. And Rachel shared um, in an article several years ago that if she wasn't a professor at Oxford, she'd probably just want to be a gardener and she would probably just want to be like gardening all the time. And like, so when I heard that, I was like, all right, one of the ways that I can showcase to her that I care about this conversation and that I want this to be an incredible chance for her to share the story is, and you'll hear this because I kept it in the episode, is my final question in my warm up section where I'm really trying to make sure that we have a solid level of trust and respect and understanding of each other before I ask them all of the content is I said, um, you know, Rachel, I just got one final question for you working through the pandemic, we've all had access to our homes a lot more than usual. We've all had a little bit of, you know, more spare time, you know, because we're not out and about as much. Please tell me that like, this has given you a chance to finally live out your dreams of becoming the gardener that you want, you know, that you've always wanted to be. And straight away, I heard laughter. I heard her, her voice, her intonation rise a little. She was shocked. She was surprised. And we spent a couple of minutes talking about why anyone who lives in Oxford should come down to the Botsman's house to grab potatoes because she's just growing potatoes like crazy. And straight away, like during that moment, um, I felt like I was like, you know, I, I feel like we're talking like friends for a second here. I feel like we're having a conversation. And I share all this because we can also do the same in the workplace. We can take a little bit longer to get to know each other. We can ask better questions. We can learn more about what matters to people because there's certainly other interviews where, um, this hasn't worked. And again, I'm not here to, this is, uh, this is being recorded. This is not the like, you know, uh, Damon tell all where he starts, you know, telling which guests were really hard to work with. Um, but there were certainly some guests where I'm like, you know, what, what would you like to know about me? Is there things I don't like know about you? If you really knew me, that would allow us to be a better conversation. And they're like, nah, let's start. I'm like, oh, okay. This is going to be really hard to get to the place I want to get this episode to be. And I think the same could happen in the, in the workplace when we're working with people where you're like, I feel like if there was a little bit more trust, I feel like if there's a little bit more that we could work with here, if I feel like if I could really understand 
some of the things that were holding you back right now or some reasons that I, I I'm struggling to understand why we're not working well together. Then there's like basically such a huge amplifier effect that we can have with our relationships. And um, I share all this because I think we can build it into like our ways of working, but also how we work. So um, I'm helping plan a team offsite um, for a couple of weeks and, you know, uh, the team offside was like, let's, let's do this, let's do this. And it was all about just like the positives and like things we want and like our mission and our values. And like my, my suggestion was, can we find like things that really annoy, uh, like that people get really annoyed about? Like, can we find like things that really grind each other? Can we find like tension points where like, if this was happening within this team that you would really struggle with? And it'll actually allow us to like, not just go like, here's all the things that, you know, we need to have the most perfect positive working environment. It's like, no, like this person hates people who don't respond to messages in a certain time frame, or this person really struggles with um, people who work out loud because they need time to process. And and then you start really kind of getting into it, and you go, wow, like okay, we're actually starting to get down to like what matters to people, how they work, what's going on. And then I think one of the things that um, you know Rachel and I spoke about was also like, you know, we bring the PTSD of previous workplaces and teams into our current teams. And if we don't have a spot to let some of that stuff out, then, you know, we just keep bringing some of these behaviors that we don't necessarily want. So I think, you know, the more we get to understand each other, the greater the trust that we can build with each other, you know, it just makes work easier. It makes work lighter. It makes like, we don't have to, like, like we said, work on these assumptions about like this person shows up in this meeting because of this way. It's like, well, we don't know that unless we spend some of these times having those conversations. So. I just wanted to share, like, I guess a little bit of like how the episode was made and some of the things that I do to bring some of these practices to life. Um, I feel like I just recorded like a voiceover for a podcast. So apologies for my like five minute, like ramble about things on, that are top of mind right now. Um, I do have some clips that I want to play. I do have some prompts, but I would love to hear from some people straight up and Jesse's going to be taking some notes so we can share these learnings back with other people. But for those who've already listened, like, I would love like what stood out to you. Um, you know, was there, I heard some people wrote notes about this. There was people mentioning they wrote blog posts. There were some people saying that they took out a billboard on the I-5 and that they put their favorite quote on it. So um, if there's anyone who wants to share some things that stood out from the episode, I would love to hear those um, in, in some small snippets. So um, we, ha we have a hand raise. Let's do it. I use the, I use the hand raise all the time, just as like, to simplify so you so we don't talk over each other i i was like super fascinated first of all i think you did such a great job damien of leading this podcast it was really really a, a great listen and i actually was super into it and i didn't want to miss anything so i read the transcript as well it was really insightful um i thought some of the key things that i wrote down um just in the conversation about um you know, sort of starting out with trusting or the ego, kind of some of the descriptive language used to describe ego and how that is from a self-reflective standpoint, some of those like competitive, needing to be right, dominating, some of those behaviors that really live in the ego and how that impacts organizations and the organizations myself and how I've worked with others within organizations. I really loved the commentation commentary about focusing how organizations focus on customer first instead of, um, or customer trust, as opposed to maybe employee trust and how um, building up trust with employees. Um, it's sort of like that conversation that's been had about, you know, we, we're employee first. If we take care of our employees, the employees will take care of their customer. I thought that was really, really great. Um, uh, the conversation about transparency as, as micromanagement, as opposed to um, this concept of it, it helps build trust as, you know, versus it really may, the way we view it, it, it begins to deteriorate trust. I thought that was really a, a great conversation and a spin maybe on the whole, the whole conversation spinning on terminology that we use and, and really flipping it and and seeing how that impacts the organization that we work with so i thought it was great yeah that seems to resonate with some people here i think uh like 
some of us might have even worked at organizations or not organizations where like transparency is like literally a value that they have. It's like one of our four values is transparency. And this was a massive rethink for me. So like, that's one of Rachel Bossman's things that she like does these like, you know, rethinks these pivots where she like takes things that we use all the time, words we use all the time and like actually goes into some of the research and science and goes like, how is this actually playing out? And um, Cassie, yeah, just like sharing some of the things that you said here about like transparency versus surveillance and like, who is the transparency for? Are you sharing all these things because, you know, someone wants to showcase that they have more information than others? Are you sharing all these things to operate from a place of fear? Are you sharing all these things because, um, you know, there isn't great communication within your, your employees. So you don't even know how to get the right information to the right people at the right time. Um, it was just like, I think it's just one of those words that gets used all the time. Like we should be more transparent. Like, okay, but like for what end, like, what are we trying to do here? You know, I think the amount of overwhelm and stress in organizations right now, I think some of it is due to like, mass communication being easier than actually spending the time to think about what messages need to be shared and when and like what is the right information that employees need in order to do their job right now like if you worked in an organization where they were like we're fully transparent here's our burn rate and you could like go into a dashboard and see that there's like nine dollars left by next week how the hell do you get your job done that week like there's no way that you can operate from any sense of like you know faith or like you know that you have trust in leadership when you're like, okay, so like I need to look for a job. And straight away, like your, your entire organization is on job boards going, yep, my company's running out of money. They're fully transparent. I was in the dashboard and like, it could have been an accounting error. Maybe the finance team didn't update it yet. Like we don't know any of these things. So again, when we operate from assumptions, when we have some of these levels of transparency that don't necessarily get to the outcome we want, maybe they're trying to increase trust, but what they've actually done is increase fear. Um, so you need to be really careful with some some of these things. So. Loving that so far. Does anyone else want to jump off mute with any shares that they have? Or if you're not able to jump off mute, um, text-based shares are also great. I'll go, um, I listened to it yesterday. Um, listened to it a while ago. I think when it was first released and forgotten about it. Um, but I think it was really good because you pick up things, you know, when you listen to it again. But I really like her definition of trust. Um, it's really simple and I think you know um, yeah around that it's just that your relationship with confidence with uncertainty and unknown and it made me think about not just the organizations and leaders that I work with but also even my own son um, who has anxiety you know and he's just started high school so it's, it just even changed a conversation I had with him last night so I think that was really good and enlightening and in terms of you know he's yeah, he's not trusting anyone because it's it's his relationship with the unknown and it's all new for him. So I thought that was really good. That really warms my heart to know that like it's actually impacting personal relationships as well. And um, yeah, like, you know, I'm a huge mental health advocate. I'm a co-founder of a men's mental health charity in Australia. It's work I've done a lot, um, spent a lot of time on. And uh, yeah, I also personally suffer from anxiety and like the unknown is the scariest thing for anyone who's looking for deep control. So, you know, my ability to trust systems, to trust the train to work, to trust the car to get somewhere. Like it's not just trusting humans. It's like every part of society is potentially like some sort of like huge red flag that you're like, is this going to like show up for me in the way that I need it to? So um, really appreciate you sharing that. Um, Isabel, I saw you come off mute. Did you have something that you want to share? Yeah, I would love to. First, thanks for sharing that too, Damon. Um, I loved the concept of trust leaps and similar to the point that you made before about uh, employees potentially being in market looking for new roles or feeling uncomfortable in the current role. The concept of trust leap had then gotten me thinking about with all of the current layoffs that we're seeing in market at the moment, how are larger businesses um, instilling trust in the talent and what are they doing to bolster that trust within the market um, so that their EVP still remains um, competitive in the market and future employees are wanting to go there because they trust that they will be safe there and have psychological safety as well as 
financial stability and all of those other things that a job offers. Um, so more of a question and more of a pondering, <laughs> um, mm. but it really got me thinking. It was quite interesting. Yes, and Isabel, like I was, I was thinking about the, how that re relates to layoffs as well. That was like a big thing that I was pondering, and I think especially in times of like market turndowns or like downturns, I mean, um, it's almost unrealistic to expect that our leaders give us this sense of confidence and conviction all the time as if they're going to have all of the answers. Um, and like that they'll be able to like help us like ha have a sense of certainty, but that's just like such an unrealistic amount of pressure to put on a leader. Uh, even though like, that's of course, what we want. So it's like such a balance between like, we can't expect this, but also like, to your point, like, how do they foster trust in the market? Like how, how can they continue to foster trust with their employees internally after they've laid people off? Like there's such a, there's a gap there. <laughs> mm. Christy. I just, um, that resonates. Um, so my passion I have a podcast on authentic leadership and I've worked with all these authors and researchers and this balance, when you just said like this, it's like an art that is so, you know, my lifelong quest to, to discover that balance between confidence and vulnerability. And that that's where transparency comes in. Like transparency can be the, the vulnerability, like, you know, during the layoff, of like, I've been up all night, you know, this is, this is so hard. This is, you know, this is a very uncertain time, you know, and being honest about all those things. But if you do too much of that, then everybody's just freaked out and depressed. <laughs> and so at the same time of like the confidence that like, you know, that honesty of showing up real, but also as a leader, you know, being able to, to give vision or to give hope and so on. So I, I just love how you describe that, that dance or that, you know, dilemma of like, how do we strike that balance between confidence and vulnerability or, you know, transparency, um, or less transparency. <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, like one thing that really makes me upset about how organizations kind of operate, especially in during some of these economic times is like when they ask the people team to do layoffs and do it with this high level of like we'll look after people and trust and all these things and then they don't find out until like after the layoffs that actually their team's in the layoffs as well and that they just needed them to do it first and then they get made part of it as well so then it's like you know the amount of trust that has been broken down for that person as a hr person in any company moving forward like the damage that that does is so massive and that's that's what like really yeah, it gets me really upset about how companies operate. Um, I'm going to post, I know this is no business, so this is not a plug, but this is actually research and it only was published today. Um, this might be gated for some people, but we actually just released research on the cost of layoffs and the, the impacts it has for the employees left behind. Um, this is an Australian-based newspaper. So if you can't read it, maybe Jesse afterwards in the follow-up to those who were here live we can send the um ungated or pdf version of this just as a thank you to everyone that was here but we've actually just released this it came out i think eight hours ago so um but i'm very aware that there's a bunch of people here who took a massive trust leap and turned up here without listening to the episode so like thank you i am going to play a clip now so that you can um hear from rachel directly um let me see how i go about sharing screen with audio share send Right. And also a, um, oh no, it's saying I need to sh share my. Uh, Here is a reminder. Jesse, I think my permissions to share audio on Zoom actually aren't there right now. Okay, um, let me see. Thank you. The, so are you going to share screen and then um, advanced and then saying share audio? You know, I think it's actually a computer thing. Like, I think I've, it's actually, I need to like reset my computer to oh. allow for it. When you get a new laptop, this happens. So, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Tell me what's, uh, what minute and I'll play it. Uh, so 1254 for about two minutes is the first one. And while you bring that up, I will just share 
with people, um, or I'll stop sharing so you can, uh, that this actually was the most downloaded episode of last year. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if we're all having major trust issues right now and that we all need to go speak to Esther Perel again about what's happening with us. Um, but uh, yeah, this one seemed to really resonate with people. Um, and even just hearing the conversation today, it's like, wow, this is like the fabric of how we operate at work. There is so much within this episode. That's why I'm so glad that like people like Rachel are, um, you know, doing her, doing the work that she does, but also sharing it really widely. And I think someone posted about like the, um, the visuals and why they're so powerful. Like Rachel does a lot of her visuals herself. She sits there and she journals and she writes little, like um, she draws little pictures about some of the things that she's trying to communicate. And um, if I go back to my L and D days, like your VAKT of learning, like we all learn in different ways. So like having the visuals along with the audio kinesthetic and tactile stuff is really powerful. So glad to hear that resonating. Jesse, I filled all that time. I'm assuming you Got found it. the, the well, right. Yeah, there we go. Is that what we said? Yep, let's do okay. it. Okay, amazing. Okay, here we go. It's a few minutes before 1254, but or a few seconds, I mean. But um, and I should say some are easier than others for me. Um, so trust, I do have a, a very simple definition. Uh, trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. Stop me if you want to go deeper into the definitions, but that definition of trust is is quite different from how other people define it. Um, other definitions of trust tend to focus on sort of knowing the outcome or knowing what to expect of people. But trust actually is about being able to navigate uncertainty and not 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 know what someone is up to. So if you know how things are going to turn out or, you know, you, you have 100% certainty, although we never really have that, in, in how someone's going to behave, very little trust is required. Um, so that's why my definition is a confident relationship with the unknown. Now, this is where my work is really going. So I'm really passionate about this relationship, but it's the relationship between trust and humility. Mm. Uh, one of the things that trust enables um, is when we have trust in ourselves and when there is trust in our cultures, there is psychological safety, um, it enables us to be confident in what we don't know. And that is actually my definition of humility. Humil humility is a confident relationship with what we don't know. The third one that I was thinking about was ego. So if, if, if I've got this understanding of trust, you know, being a confident relationship, the unknown. You can tell Jesse and I were communicating back and forth saying, stop now, pause. I think this is it. So uh, you're seeing us do live DJing here. Um, yeah, that one, um, you know, I think for anyone who wants to become a more effective communicator, like thinking about the terminology that you use all the time and having a really good definition, something that you can kind of like even like put on a t-shirt or like that just rolls off your tongue. And I think that's what makes Rachel such an effective communicator is she understands the things that she uses all the time, the, the key concepts she wants people to know. She has really good definitions on how to bring those to life. And even just like watching people listen to that, you can see like oh, some of people like taking notes on those things is because she's really good at communicating those terms clearly in a way that I think resonates with people. So um, for anyone who heard maybe that for the first time and has also heard our conversation, I would love to hear if there's anything that sort of came up from um, what you just heard. Yeah, Cami. So it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, she's saying that trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. But then she also says humility is a confident relationship with what we don't know. And I'm reading this transcript. So humility and confidence are the same? The way I kind of interpreted it is that, um, you know, I think trust is saying that there is things that I don't have control over and that there is things that I don't know about how these things are going to play out. I don't necessarily know someone's intentions in a meeting, but I trust that we're able to get to the outcome together and that we're working in good faith. I guess humility was that side, you know, and it really played into ego. It was about 
really being okay. And, you know, I think a lot of people struggle to say that like, I'm so sorry. Like, I actually don't know what that term means like in a meeting oh, or like facing, you know. facing yourselves as opposed to facing other. I got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that clarity. Um, Cause I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't, that doesn't quite make sense. Um, yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm good with uncertainty of all kinds. I invite it. A little chaos is good. <laughs> I think you would thrive li living in Italy. I've never seen so much organized chaos. Or if there's people who've listened to it already and you have reflections, would love to um, love to hear if there's anything else that came up after that definition. I love the later, like following on to the conversation with like this exact definition, which is like uh, Susan David's definition around discomfort is the price of admission to a meaningful life. And I, that I just like, I even share, I even shared that on Instagram today because I saw her post about it and I was like, dang, that's so good. Like, it's still resonating for me personally. Um, that like, I'm like, gosh, I want that like tattooed on me or something <laughs> like that. <where> like, <laughs> but yeah, so good. And if but you're not familiar with Susan David's work, she's actually going to be on the Culture First podcast this year. She's an incredible uh, researcher and author as well. So uh very excited to have a chat with her as well so you've got to get that tattoo done so i can i can tell her <laughs> yeah terry trespicio is also a new york times best-selling author she says you don't you don't ever have to step outside your comfort zone um and she kind of puts that notion on your on her, on its ear because we we don't accomplish great things outside of our comfort zone. We do accomplish great things by expanding our comfort zone, little by little by little by little. And I just love that idea that we don't. Yes, we do need to embrace being uncomfortable, but no, we don't have to abandon where we feel safe, abandon our own self trust to accomplish mm. great things. Yeah, we don't want to lose ourselves in that ability to kind of like find our edge and like keep expanding what we feel comfortable with. You don't want to like go too far away from some of the things that are important to you and how, how you operate. Uh, Jess is going to get another clip um, up oh, and ready, just, but Christy, yeah. Um, that just totally makes me think of the recent podcast of Brene Brown when she's talking about the difference between safe spaces and brave spaces. And you said it in some beautiful words. I don't know if you pronounce it, Cami, um, but I think it's all honing in on that same description that like discomfort is going to be a part of this. And the goal is not quote safety, meaning lack of discomfort and that there is, um, courage that's required and i love that that you described that i haven't heard somebody say that but it's expanding your comfort zone so that it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then and then when i think about cultures i think about growing my things leadership so i think about growing leaders where they've expanded that bigger and bigger and bigger so that no matter how much shit is going on in like a hostile conversation or like, <laughs> like things get toxic or things get really stressful or uncertain, that they can be like in their comfort zone, grounded in their core values, observer, you know, observer what's going on in themselves and in others and create the space um, that totally changes the environment of how they resolve that together. So thank you, Cami. That was a great image. Love that. Uh, just because of conscious of time, Jesse's going to play the second clip that we wanted to play. And we touched on some of these things as well about, um, yeah, vulnerability loops and how some of these things play out. So we'll listen to um, this next little clip. Some baseline level of trust. And then um, I think, Dan Cole's work on this is brilliant. So he describes this uh, idea that is really visual called a vulnerability loop. And so the way it works and, and the way it's rocket fuel for trust is say, Damon, you send me a vulnerability signal. Um, so you actually 
did this at the start of the podcast, right? Telling me um, something personal. Um, mm -hmm. Now, if I don't catch it, and sort of respect the signal and then in some way signal back that leaves you really exposed and that will damage trust but if right. i send a signal back we go in this loop um and it really accelerates trust particularly early on um in relationships so uh, i always think it's interesting like people you work with when you, it can take, a, and for some people, it can take a few weeks or even a few months, uh, when you see that first vulnerability loop. And yeah. as uh, a leader of a team, um, sometimes you could keep putting vulnerability signals out there and, and the other team person doesn't pick that up. But the first time you see that loop really in action and you see other people starting to pick up on that loop, it's really powerful. As I said, in other, in other situations, you need a lot of trust for vulnerability to happen. Um, and that can be where people have had a very bad experience in the past um, from their childhood. There's something that has happened in their family, um, but also in the workplace where right. um, someone has breached their trust in a big way. Now asking that person to be, to be vulnerable before trust is there, um, is a, it's more than a stretch. It, it's actually not respecting where that person is and what that person needs. Like nodding along, like I was like listening to it for the first time. Like, that's a really good point, Rachel. I was like, like I wasn't actually in the room when that conversation happened. Um, <laughs> I like I did I I listen to these episodes so much when I have to like edit them and do voiceovers that you kind of forget the conversation at times because you're like looking for certain things and um yeah there was a lot there um I shared a little bit at the start of this conversation about some of the things I do before an interview and like what Rachel then shared back was that I shared something with her I had a question that I had about something that um was relevant to my experience about my relationship with trust. And I asked her opinion on it before as we were getting ready. And I didn't realize I was doing a vulnerability loop exercise with her, but she, she caught it and she was able to like talk to me about that. And we like had a conversation and I, you know, I think that was probably just probably way more important than the, the potato chat about that being a good conversation. And it was the fact that I, you know, put some of those things out there and that she actually caught them. And I think, there was an, another version of that story where like she didn't catch it and then the conversation could have been very different. And I think about our first interactions with people in the workplace. I'm sure we've all worked with people where like, it's like their first day and they like start sharing like deeply personal things. You're like, Whoa, we need to, we need to warm up to this. Like, you know, I'm, we are, we, we are not at that level yet. Or if you, you know, have the unfortunate displeasure on going on first dates these days, especially in the age of, 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 of the internet and you're on a first date and someone's just sharing their like deeper stories with you. You're like, we need to build up to connection and trust. And I think the same thing happens in the workplace is that we can't just throw, like if someone just keeps putting vulnerability out there and it's not being caught, obviously they could shut down, but you also need to kind of know when it's the right moment to put some of these things out there. You know, when have we built up some of that time? So um, yeah, for me, you know, that was one of the definitely the big aha moments was um it's not about going into a vulnerability battle with with someone going oh that's really interesting you shared that and then responding with your version and it's like catching it acknowledging that like that you appreciate that there was that share there and like saying like oh this is uh this is an opening this is an invitation into a deeper relationship with this person this is an opening into a chance of a higher level of trust within this team and these are things that we want to kind of be able to permeate throughout all of our teams so that people do feel mm -hmm. safe and that they don't breach it or it doesn't go too far and I think later on in the episode she talks about some of the issues with you know she's a big fan of Brené Brown but you know some of the issues with just throwing vulnerability out there as a thing we should all be doing all the time it lacks some of the nuance and the and the safety that we need with the conversation any yeah Christy you got your hand up yeah, that phrase of a vulnerability loop, man, I love that. I used to always, with authenticity, talk about like leaders go first with regard to vulnerability, like they they set the tone. And I just had this happen when I'd never heard it, like that they didn't catch the cue. 
So I was in a meeting with a client and there's this, you know, a deep relationship working very closely and the, the individual really triggered and like uh, kind of attacked me, like got frustrated and told me all the reasons in a public space while, while I was so frustrating. And so I decided afterwards, cause I was like, I was floored by how she did that. So I, I, I pulled from this book, Connect which is about exceptional building exceptional relationships. He talks about expressing a pinch before it becomes a crunch. So I just sent her a note and I just thought, okay, I just want to process this. And I just wanted to express like, you know, there was, there was a pinch in that meeting and I thought it was going to be a chance. I was a bit vulnerable in sharing that and like, Hey, you know, we're all learning. And so, on. and I thought it was going to be a chance for her to say, I'm sorry. And what I got back instead was about, seven specifics about corrective feedback you know all the reasons why I was frustrated so I'm just wondering from all of you like when you do this when you do the vulnerability loop and they don't catch it and they in fact they not only don't catch it but they like miss it so bad <laughs> that it like I could see how that just destroyed trust so much so I just love other thoughts on um your experience of this vulnerability loop but I, I see how real that is if they don't catch it it really does damage I was just thinking of like when when I was reflecting on this exact part of the episode which is like the whole like soft skills are hard skills thing came up for me and how certain individuals that have like they don't pick up on those cues they don't have the same mirror neurons you know like maybe they are like a uh, on the spectrum of some sort and then they that's just not something that they're like able to do um as well as someone that has maybe a higher level of eq and that came up for me which i was like oh my gosh like that can be missed all of the time for those individuals, uh, like, or like way more often. So that came up for me. Um, I don't know. I'll stop talking, but yeah, Cammie. It's been my experience that people like that are either not capable or not interested in your vulnerability. And in those instances, what I do is mirror back what I've heard from them. It sounds like you're frustrated and you want X, Y, and Z to change. And it sounds like, you know, and you just repeat back everything you have, you you've said, they've said. And a lot of times they just feel like they want to be heard and, and just repeating those things back. Um, in my conflict resolution workshops, I normally do, okay, here's the emotion that we're, that I'm seeing. I feel frustrated. You seem a little frustrated too. You want X, Y, and Z to happen, but I want A, B, and C to happen. And then you ask for a solution. And those are keywords, asking and solution, never using the word compromise, because everybody feels icky when they have to compromise. But saying, you know, this is what happened. It sounds like you want this to happen and you feel this way. I feel this way. What's a solution to this that we can both live with? And then you shut up. You're asking, you're, you're identifying this issue and you're putting it on the table in front of you and then you're inviting them to come to your side of the table and saying, what's a solution that we can both live with? And, and when I remember to use it, when, when I can unplug my own emotions out of it, it always works. Hmm. When it doesn't work is when my own ego gets involved or as... <laughs> It, there's a saying in our family, swole up and shut up. When you feel like, well, I've been wronged and, you know, you get swole up and shut up. But if you can remember to use it, it's always worked for me. Can you put the phrasing in the chat? <laughs> Happily. Oh, beautiful. I think a lot of the exercises that, you know, Rachel and I worked through on this episode are things that like we should be like, I don't see them as like, um like one-off moments to try like achieve something it's kind of like it's behaviors that we should be building into the operating rhythm of how we're op like working in order to make these interactions safer and that the conversation flows better and whenever I kind of feel like especially if I feel like you're like I'm putting all these things out and I'm putting all these signals out and like I'm not getting things back and if I find myself getting 
really caught in the emotions of work. One of the ways that I find it really powerful to distance myself from the feeling versus the fact is I do this um, exercise where I was like, all right, in that meeting, if there was a camera in the corner, what did it capture? And the only thing that a camera can capture is like things that definitely happened. And it was like, there was four people in the room. Two people were talking. Um, people were sitting down. It went for 32 minutes. People left the room, right? But what the camera doesn't capture is, oh, sadness, anger. That person may be pissed off. That person didn't respect me. Like, all these other things, like everything else is a story we tell ourselves about what's happening in the workplace. A camera can only capture things that are factually true. And whenever I find myself in one of these moments where I'm like, all right, like, you know, it's like, oh, my trust was broken or my vulnerability was breached or all these things. I'm like, you know, these are emotions I'm having about my experience in the workplace. But if I need to distance myself, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, that we should repress those things. Like those things are true. They impact how we're operating and impact our ability to feel good about what we're doing. But if I find myself getting too caught up in it, I just go back to like the camera technique and go, if a camera was there, what is true? And then you go, okay, they're the only things that actually happened. Everything else are stories I'm telling myself. How do I re reckon with those stories? And then maybe it is having that follow-up conversation and going, look, you know, something happened in that meeting. Here's what I experienced. Here's what, what happened. You spoke, I spoke, these things. And then it allows us to kind of just come in with, and, you know, um, the episode, the podcast listeners club I did before this was with Priya Parker and, you know, she's a conflict resolution expert. And, uh, you know, she's also very good at all these techniques about what actually happened, how many people were there, when were they invited, what went down in the room, what were the intentions, how did you like, um, how did those things end up becoming true? So, yeah, sometimes... I think for anyone who even attends something like this, we're obviously probably pretty tuned in to like how we're feeling about our experience at work and we want to get better with it. So we're probably outliers. So I think sometimes some of these things is like, we can't tell everyone to jump on the bus with us because some people just either aren't wired that way or don't want to, but we can use some of these techniques to help us, you know, reckon with what's happening as, as well as, you know, try to create cultures where these things become true more often. I love that you mentioned Brene Brown's, um, the story I tell myself is, um, that's been really helpful with, um, very personal relationships, not necessarily work ones for me, but the story I'm telling myself is you're too freaking lazy to unload the dishwasher, but I know that's not true. So tell me what's really happening. Mm. Um, yeah. And in a workplace, the, the phrase that an HR gal told me once is I feel blank when you blank, can we blank? And that validates your own feelings. It's saying what you've witnessed or giving a very specific example and then offering up a solution. But again, that, that one that one has not always worked for me, but it's information. The framework that like, yes, following on to that, Cami, the one that I like think about a lot is like starting with the facts, like here's what's happening. Um, here's the story I'm telling myself um here's what I need like <laughs> or like just saying like what like here's what I would like to happen but like not getting attached to this idea of like this thing needs to happen you know so it's like but going back to your point about what if you just ask them okay what can we do about this and letting them come up with a solution <laughs> yeah so good that that phrase of well, what's a solution we can both live with here yes oh writing that what's down. A, what's a solution we can both, I, I taught, I learned that from my kids and I taught it to my kids. They were like five and five and seven. And I was so tired of being the referee. And finally I was like, all right, you want to put your book away. You want him out of your room. I can tell you're both really upset. What are you guys going to do about it? What's a solution that you can both live with and then walk away. And they became master mediators. And I, I got to walk away from the role of being referee, referee as parent. Sounds like a much better strategy than just telling them to go sit outside for 20 minutes and think about their behaviors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Jesse, do you want to, do you want to round, yeah. bring us home in terms of next steps? And I just want to also just thank everyone for obviously being here and sharing and being in conversation and especially for those who just wanted to come and listen and be part of it. Like you're, you know, we love that just as much as the people who want to share and reflect you know, this is a podcast listeners club, not a post podcast listeners who also need to like talk club. So for those who were just off video listening, like I also see you and I just want to say thank you for coming as well. Oh, 
Well, very traditional culture first of us, um, moving us into the action phase of what can we do to put this, these learnings into action? Just want to kind of have a brief discussion about, and I know some people may need some time to process some of the stuff and I don't expect to have your, like something that you're going to commit to taking action on, but is there anything that maybe like hit for someone that they're like, this is how I'm going to implement this, or this is like one small thing I can do immediately. Does anything come to mind for you all? I'll just say, you know, I think even, um, you know, Cami, like the, the phrases that you give, I find that when you give people, um, it, it, it's harder for some folks that maybe aren't as like, high in emotional intelligence. Um, sometimes the concept is hard for them to grasp, but if you give them specific language, um, it's much easier for them to grasp it. So I know like, um, in fact, I just did a session this morning with one of the, with a company that is really trying to drive a more participatory um, performance management process. They're trying to get away from the the old school, you know, once a year, the manager sits and dishes out, you know, sort of, you know, this is all of the, you know, here's the feedback and they just sit and listen. And so, but it's a whole different shift in how they've done this before. So in the training, not only were we talking about conceptually, um, you know, we just spent a lot of time with giving examples of, you know, what does it mean to receive feedback? What does it mean to give feedback and giving them some of the language um, and cues? Because again, <clears throat> depending on the type of audience, some folks, they just really need that handed to them. Um, they don't necessarily have the ability to just take the concept and figure out how to put it into practice. So um Anyway, I find that when we work with people like that, they're just so grateful to have tools and resources that they can literally like have a script, you know, that they can use certain words or, you know, can you, you know, just little cues of like, <clears throat> um, you know, I think I've heard you say this, can you please elaborate on that? Or I care what you are saying, um, please tell me more, or just certain little phrases that um, may not come naturally to them. Jesse, oh, Jesse I think you're muted. <laughs> ha, sorry, I said thanks, Michelle, but Isabel, yes, please. Um, I have noticed that over the course of this call, you have said yes and. And I think that for me is a trust signal that I picked up and closes that vulnerability loop or you know, perpetuates that vulnerability loop um, when someone shares something, whether it be vulnerable or whether it be making a point or, you know, otherwise, I think that's something that I'm going to pick up and take on with me. So thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, thanks for the reflection. That's been a fun thing for me to start getting into. It's very, I love improv comedy though. So <laughs> I know it's great. Keep it up. <laughs> so good. In all many right, ways, work is just a big version of Saturday Night Live where we're all yeah. just up there on stage trying, trying to make it all make sense, right? So like, yes, and to all of the things. Love that. Just one big giant skit. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What's the camera showing on stage? Who who are the actors on stage? <laughs> yeah. What costume am I wearing? What role am I playing? Who's here? Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, okay. I know we have five minutes. Um, I'm just going to like kind of go and uh, well, I'll just go around my screen. Um, you're welcome to pass if you don't feel comfortable. But I'd love to just like have you share either one word or one sentence to kind of just check out from your experience. So either one word, one sentence. I'm going to start at the top of my screen and then I'm just going to call names across. Um, so Cami, you're in the top left, <laughs> starting with you. We're better together. Ooh, full stop, full stop mic drop. <laughs> 
Yes, Ann Trav. Um, grateful. Yes, Ann Isabel. Whole and whole. Ooh, love whole. Yes, Ann Cherry. Um, I have a phrase, my cup is full. Yes, Ann Allison. Self-reflection on use of transparency. Mm. Yes, Ann Christy. Wait, oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. So many things. Helping people to expand their comfort zone versus getting outside of it. Mm. Another phrase we need to rethink. <laughs> Add that to the list. <laughs> Michelle. Oh, wait, you're on mute. Um, just more, um, a deeper understanding of trust and navigating uncertainty. Yes, and Teresa. Um, I would say releasing the ego. Powerful. Yes, and Cassie. I'm more hopeful. Mm, yes, and Connie. How do I get others to release the ego? Yes, vulnerability loops, maybe. <laughs> yes, and Damon. I've actually got a new tool coming out called the Ego Releaser for nine ninety nine. You can buy it and just give it to anyone, and it's um, it's amazing. It's going to sell like hotcakes. It's on um, Amazon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah loads yeah today's my last day at cold tramp but i've already made 10 million from that product so see you later um but no um uh i feel really uh seen i was sharing with uh tj at the start of this episode of, of when we had our little session together was like i forget that people listen to the show like the fact that people turned up with notes and like that like the you know, things that they wanted to discuss is just really um like warms my heart a lot so um i feel really seen and also like, yeah, just uh, a lot of gra gratitude and thank, thank you to everyone who listens and comes and shares. Oh, so good. All right. Um, I, we're going to share this deck out with you all with like notes. Um, we, uh, Culture First Global Mia is happening on March 22nd. So feel free to register for that. All of the content from both North America and APAC are available as well online with some incredible speakers that were there. Um, we'll be reaching out about which episode should we do next for this podcast listeners club. Of course, we always love reviews. Uh, uh, for the podcast as well on wherever you listen to it, Apple, Spotify, Audible. Um, join our People Geek Slack community if you aren't already in there. There's all, all, almost 20,000 people sharing ideas and resources and best practices in there. And um, obviously this is part of the global chapter, but check out a local chapter or um, maybe some of the topic-based chapters that we're starting to roll out or maybe start a chapter. So anyway, there we are. I'm going to do a clap out. Um, so maybe if you haven't seen this before, but what I'm going to do is uh, we're all going to come off mute. And uh, after three, I'm going to count, we're going to, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to say one, two, three. And after three, we're all going to clap. And then the zoom meeting's just going to shut off. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Actually, I don't want to count. Uh, Cammy, would you count for us? I would love if you would do this. <laughs> <laughs> And a one, and a two, and a three.